two mothers murdered in front of their children almost 40 years apart by the same man. This uh, spike in crime here all of a sudden, it really is disturbing. And this is a, a wonderful community, I believe, and cohesive and uh, close-knit. People have been born and raised here. Kimberly Dobby was on a routine trip to the laundromat in 2018 with her twin boys. She was taking a phone call outside when security footage captured the moment 76-year-old Albert Flick stabbed her to death on a street in Lewiston, Maine. He wasn't trying to get away with anything. Did it in broad daylight in front of dozens of witnesses, in front of her children. The day of the murder, Laura Kirkland had eaten breakfast with Kimberly Dobby and her sons. The women had met a few months earlier at a shelter where they were both living. The perkiest person I've ever met. I've never seen anyone with that much energy in my life. And uh, she was always there uh, for the kids. I'm just glad I got to hug her that morning. My friend Lori called me that morning and said that she had heard something. A woman who had been stabbed in front of her kids and she was thinking that it might be Kim. Then she called back and told me that she found out that, that Kim had been stabbed. And I was expecting to go visit her. I said, what hospital is she in? And that's when she said she's dead. So that's how I found out. Flick had gotten to know the women at their local library he seemed harmless, but neither they nor the local authorities knew about his past. It was a surprise for me. I never saw him as a threat. I don't think anyone saw him as a threat. It was average height, kind of small and elderly. He knew how to act in public. He didn't stick out. He wasn't weird, really, except for just kind of following her around like a lost puppy. Flick became infatuated with Kimberly. He told me probably about a month after Kim got there that he saw her and that he was blown away by her beauty. But uh, she just started getting annoyed by his constant attention and not leaving alone. And finally, Kathy, another woman who was there with us, and I told her, and Lori too, you need to tell this guy, stop. So she did, but again, so nice. She never saw the bad in anybody. I saw the bad in him from the first day and I didn't like him. No one knew his past. No one, even the police department, had no idea that he had murdered his first wife. In 1979, after Flick's wife Sandra served him with divorce papers, he killed her with a knife in front of her daughter. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison he served 21 years and was let out in 2000 for good behavior. By 2010, Flick had amassed a rap sheet that included criminal threatening, assault, and violating probation. That same year, while on probation, Flick was in court yet again for assaulting a woman with a knife. He pleaded guilty, and at his sentencing, the prosecutor fought for a long prison stay. I know that the defendant is an older man and that the court and society may think that this individual is going to stop committing crimes, um, especially crimes against women and violent crimes against women with weapons. But history has really shown that he's just not about to do that. And so I think the only appropriate sentence is for a significant time in prison. When you have a probation officer who's saying that this person is going to be violent, to me that's a very big red flag. To me, Your Honor, is no better predictor for future behavior than past behavior. He's an extremely violent individual when it comes to relationships. He doesn't appear to slow down at this point. I don't see him slowing down in the near future. Judge Robert Crawley felt differently. He sentenced Flick to just under three years. There's absolutely nothing in Mr. Flick's past history that suggests that he is going to choose to abandon his behaviors of assaultive conduct toward women. However, uh, from his appearance and the fact of the date of his birth, uh, he will be 72 or 73 when released from the probation revocation. And 
at some point, Mr. Flick is going to age out of his capacity to engage in this conduct, and incarcerating him beyond the time that he ages out doesn't seem to me to make good sense from a criminological or fiscal perspective. After completing that sentence, he violated probation and landed back in prison. After getting out, at the age of 76, Flick murdered Kimberly in broad daylight. He held the knife, but other people put him back on the street, and that's not right. I mean, with my mother, it was the first time, so it was something different. It was, you know, he was held accountable according to whatever the judge found fit at that point in time. But since 2000, there's been multiple incidences, and there's no reason that he was on the street. The boys are the ones that are going to live with it. I think the judge should have to explain to them. Tell them what law it was or at what age it's okay and what age you're done being a danger and how come they had to watch your mother be slaughtered on the street. This was so preventable. And hindsight's twenty twenty, but this is, this is the hardest way to learn that this needs to be done now. Kim wasn't the first person for this to happen to, and she's not going to be the last. We as a community now know and recognize the connection between homicide and domestic violence. And it's very important for us as a state to recognize that half of the homicides that have been committed uh, recently in Maine have connections to domestic violence. Uh, so maybe it's time that we start taking domestic violence a lot more seriously. Flick was sentenced to life in prison for Kimberly's murder in July 2019. I'm happy knowing that he's going to die in prison. Even though Flick is finally behind bars for good, the community in Maine where Kimberly lived has been left wondering, could this happen again? Our correspondent Alexandra Stone spoke with WMTW photographer Kevin Fowler, who reported on this case. I think this whole, you know, the whole idea that, that, that somebody can, can be you know, murdered in broad daylight in, in a street full of people in front of a busy laundromat. It was shocking to the community. Lewiston's, Lewiston's had its ups and downs over the years as a city. It's not as bad or a bad a reputation as it used to have. It's, it's a much uh, a much calmer, quieter city, um, probably within the last decade or so. I think also, too, to see, to have that uh, security camera footage, it makes it all that much more real. And, and to see her walking and then he kind of walks by and then you see people running to try and rescue her and, and stop the incident. That, that I think made it really visceral for, for people to see. How did Albert Flick manage to slip under the radar of law enforcement? I think at the time when we covered the original story in the summer, when the incident happened in Lewiston, I do recall it came as a surprise that this guy was out and about walking around on the streets to the police at the time. And why or how that happened, I think it may have been how they downplayed the incident in 2014 and that he got right back out on the street in a really, really short amount of time. And apparently nobody was noticing a pattern of behavior, even though I think the thing in 2014 was like about his third recording recorded incident with a woman and a knife. And one of Kimberly's friends, Laura, said local police weren't aware of Flick's first murder. Do you know if that's true? We didn't talk to any police officers for this particular story. What I do know is that the, the big issue with our story was how the judge had given him fairly light sentence and really considered his past history with women and how unfortunate it was that he was free to walk about, sort of be a transient in Lewiston and befriend this woman, and uh, then the worst thing happened. Is there anything important we can take away from this case? For me, it left a lot of questions on the table in terms of did anybody learn anything from this in terms of the people who are gonna have to make decisions like this again in the future. And you know, it's not unheard of that somebody got a lighter sentence or got released because it looked like things were gonna be okay and the next thing they do is reoffend. And nobody has a crystal ball that can see if that's gonna work. And I'm sure that a lot of times that their rehabilitation in either in jail or a psychiatric hospital has worked and, it, and they do assimilate back into society. But you know, at a certain point, you can only do so much you know, like as a judge. It's a very, very complex issue. And I know that a lot of DAs and judges and, and, and people in the 
legislature struggle with trying to figure out how to keep dangerous people off the street or determining whether they're dangerous enough that somebody needs to take that extra step.